Live from Boston, Massachusetts, extracting the signal from the noise, it's The Cube, covering Red Hat Summit 2015. Brought to you by Red Hat. Now your hosts, Dave Vellante and Stu Miniman. Welcome to Back Bay of Boston, everybody. This is Dave Vellante of Wikibon with Stu Miniman. This is Red Hat Summit, and we are here, wall-to-wall -wall coverage for two days. This is SiliconANGLE, Wikibon's The Cube. The Cube goes out to the events. We extract the signal from the noise. This is our 39th event so far this year, Stu. Uh, it's been rocking. It's nice to be home in Boston for a change. <laughs> yeah, Dave, you know, uh, you said how many events we've done. It's our third this week. So uh, we, we, we said leading into what's basically the last week uh, of our spring tour here, and a nice short drive for you and me to come into Boston, except for the fact that we sw swung through San Francisco on the way. You were at the Oracle PaaS announcement, I was at DockerCon, uh, but yeah, excited to be back home. It's definitely PaaS week here. You know, Stu, I've been trying to squint through, and, and you know, uh, we talk about a lot at Wikibon, this whole PaaS trend. Is it infrastructure as a service plus? Like what Amazon's doing? Is it is it SaaS minus what Salesforce is doing? You got Cloud Foundry in there, now of course you got Red Hat coming in a big play, <laughs> and this week we had, Oracle going all in on PaaS, yeah, IBM and, and, with and, Bluemix. And, 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 and Dave, you got all those distinctions, and if containerization and Docker takes off like we think, might that PaaS discussion all be passe, if you will. <laughs> you know, you we will just take PaaS. over and not really need a full PaaS layer because containerization and microservices, maybe I don't need a full PaaS layer. Really, is that the discussion that was going on so, at uh, so DockerCon? There, there are definitely certain companies uh, that, that, that are pitching that, uh, you know, whole discussion uh, that, you know, we can have the modern applications, we can go there, but uh, I don't necessarily need it because one of the, the early things, what does PaaS give me, is I, I write my software once and can use it on a lot of different infrastructure environments. Well, containers give us that piece, you know, where did Docker come from? Docker came from Dot Cloud, which was a PaaS company. It was just kind of the little feature that they were using that turned into Docker. So, <laughs> you know, Red Hat's talking about how Docker and Kubernetes fit into what they're doing to OpenShift. So, you know, we're still real early here, Dave, and you know, it's going to take a few years. Well, to but so out. much of PaaS is application integration, and integration all throughout the stack, and I think that's a big theme that we certainly heard uh, yesterday uh, in the keynotes. Your, your recent guest was talking a lot about convergence within industries and also about integration. Uh, we certainly heard a lot of, of, about that this week uh, out in California. What are your thoughts on that, Stu? I mean, if you've, if you've got to have you know, integration, is Docker and containers, and we got to talk about OCP, are they going to be able to deliver that sort of end-to-end -end integration? Yeah, that, that, that's a great point, Dave, because, you know, I mean, Docker is a tool here, um, and, you know, building up the stacks and having the, the, the real knowledge to help build those applications is a lot of work. I mean, you know, look at, you know, Cloud Foundry, and they bought Pivotal Labs that's helping customers, you know, work through that knot hole uh, of how to build, you know, you know distributed apps, cloud-native applications. Um, you know, it, that, that's really where the work is. You know, what's happening, uh, you know, we were just talking to Samsung and Red Hat, and how are they, you know, making applications that are more mobile? You know, you've got SAP here, uh, you know, to trying to help, you know, real business applications, you know, move to this new world. So, um, the, the big air gap I've seen for the last bunch of years, Dave, is, you know, I, I've got my old apps that have been running for way too long. I think the number I hear from you usually is, you know, 15 plus years is the average enterprise application, and what we need to get is more agile, and we need to do that by re-architecting, you know, retooling, replatforming uh, what we're doing. Let's talk about OCP, uh, not to be confused with the other OCP, Open Container Platform, right? It's a basically core OS and Docker kind of making up, or not making up, but shaking hands and saying, all right, let's come together. You're making faces. What's the real <laughs> scoop between uh, around OCP? Yeah. So uh, if we talk about you know the original OCP was the Open Compute Project, which is a hardware project that says let's create you know a a, a standard so that I can just take you know standard commodity hardware, build it in a certain way, and work for you know across you know lots of you know cloud scalable environments. So. This open container uh, OCP is the software OCP, as I, I, I've said, um, and what that does is at the, the, the most basic level, the runtime of containers, I want to have something uh, that is going to work across multiple environments. So, as you said, you know, CoreOS and Docker are two of the main players. Uh, about six months ago when CoreOS launched Rocket, um, there was kind of a ripple in the container space and oh said, oh wait, we thought Docker was the thing and now we have you know, competing uh, you know, projects out there. So if, if I can start with that kind of basic you know, 
fundamental building block and then on top of that have you know rocker and some of the other docker projects and everything like that at least if i you know standardize you know that first piece um I'm not going to get, you know, I mean, these are all open source projects, Dave, but there's that worry of being locked in or, or making the wrong decisions. I don't want to have a VHS versus Betamax decision. I want to have something that is going to work across uh, multiple platforms. Well, we had Core OS on a couple weeks ago down in Miami at the Nutanix event, and, and essentially my takeaway was that at the time I felt like, okay, this is competition for Docker. Is that, is that right? And, and, and I guess they're going to standardize at the, at, the, at the core level, no pun intended, uh, and then compete higher up in the stack, is that right? Yeah, you're absolutely right, Dave. You know, uh, CoreOS and Docker, I think, have similar missions. Uh, you know, Docker is helping to build this platform and the ecosystem, and there's lots of projects that make up, you know, there's Docker Machine, Docker Compose, Docker Engine, uh, you know, uh, Docker Network is going to be coming out soon, and most of these are plug a architectures that work with, you know, a very broad and amazingly growing ecosystem. I mean, Dave, 2,000 people in San Francisco, everybody kind of tripping each over each other to try to say that I'm more Docker and more integrated with Docker. I mean, Amazon, Microsoft, you know, all big guys there, you know, throwing a ton of resources there. Um, so, you know, CoreOS says they want to create a bunch of open source tools and, and allow people to build with them. So uh, th they've, they've got their tectonic platform that they're looking to pull together their pieces, and absolutely CoreOS and Docker will compete in this space. But we had a good handshake uh, between uh, Solomon Hikes, uh, the founder of Docker, and Alex Polby, who's the, the CEO. I actually, I got to talk to Alex uh, briefly off camera. Uh, I talked to the Docker guys, uh, and uh, you know, I, I don't think it's all you know unicorns and rainbows just yet that you know there is going to be competition there, um, but in many ways, Dave, we know competition is good uh, for you know the industry. So you know the, the, it, it's really early days. Docker is by far you know the clear leader in the space. So let's talk about OpenStack. Uh, open let's talk about Red Hat. And we'll, sorry, when you talk about Red Hat, it's going to lead to a discussion about OpenStack. But let's break down the company a little bit. Uh, it took a long time for Red Hat to bake. The industry allowed it to bake. Uh, you know, way, way, way back in the mid '90s, people talked about Linux potentially threatening Microsoft's uh, dominance, and that's exactly what, what happened. And Red Hat sort of, sort of bumped along and did its committer thing, and you know, just ate glass for a long, long time. And the industry supported it. So obviously, IBM putting pouring a lot of money into into Linux and into open source. But now. Fast forward to 2015, you've got a company that has a $15 billion market valuation. They'll surpass $2 billion uh, this year, you know, in my estimation. Uh, they're growing it easily at 15%, typically at a 20 plus percent clip. Now the only thing that could halt that is currency headwinds. You know, they do a fair amount of business overseas, but they've got a very, very strong business in Red Hat Enterprise Linux, what's known as RHEL. Uh, it's probably 75 to 80% of its business. It's growing, however, more slowly than the other parts of its business, particularly OpenShift, which is its PaaS layer, and its cloud platform. It's also made some other acquisitions to diversify, expand its TAM, and grow as a company. So let's break that down, Stu. How do you look at uh, Red Hat as a company, its core offering, RHEL, and its new piece parts, which include PaaS, includes storage, includes cloud? Yeah, so, so, so Dave, there's, there's really the two sides of the business. Uh, there, there's the enterprise side, which where I tend to spend a little more time, and really that, that application focus, um, which is, is majorly important. We'll spend lots of time talking about that too. But on the enterprise side, right, is they started to kind of build up the stack and, and build out. So you, you, you talk great about Red Hat Enterprise Linux. Uh, I love, we're going to have Paul Carmier on uh, later today. Uh, he was and, great in the keynote. And, and, and yeah, you know, he was there in the early days of Linux when, you know, I think Red Hat was making as much money off t-shirts as they were off of you know, their <laughs> subscription there. Uh, so um, we were joking this week at DockerCon, you know, I mean, all the geeks were grabbing tons of t-shirts, you know, hugely exciting. Um, I, I remember, you know, back in, you know, the late 90s, early 2000s, you know, I had Penguin stuff everywhere, Dave, because you, you'd go get the Linux stuff. You know, I, I've got a Red Hat hat probably from, you know, 15 years ago. I had little Penguin squishies that I'd get from every vendor because everybody was trying to do, um, you know, Linux. But uh, so as we went about Red Hat Enterprise Linux, uh, you know, VMware, that, you know, Red Hat admitted they, you know, kind of had a bump in the road. You know, VMware came in with the proprietary stack of virtualization and allowed customers to take their Microsoft apps and the Linux apps and virtualize it, and that was great. So, Red Hat's play is RHEV, Red Hat Enterprise Virtualization, which is built off KVM, uh, and 
for Red Hat customers that love Red Hat Linux and have a lot of Linux apps, it was a great way to kind of expand into virtualization. Um, but as we know, KVM tends to live in the service providers. Um, you know, so, so some pretty big enterprises are using it, but in the you know the enterprise data center, uh, you know, VMware is still dominant in that space. Um, and so, you know, Red Hat, you know, does need to expand there. Where Red Hat has had a, a huge move over the last couple of years is in OpenStack. Um, so, you know, they've made a bunch of acquisitions, uh, you know, on the storage side, they had bought Gluster a few years back, really before the OpenStack, they bought uh, Ink Tank, which is the company, the, the kind of the leader in the Ceph uh, project. Uh, they bought Evenovance. There was another management company. They bought um, they bought CentOS, uh, which was like another Linux uh, that, that kind, kind of fits in the space. Uh, and they launched Atomic last year at Red Hat Summit. So they're really helping. If you look at you know I, what I think of OpenStack is um, th there's a whole bunch of different projects, and it's trying to almost take that Linux. Uh, you know, capability and mentality and bringing it to the entire stack. So, you know, storage, compute, networking, management, orchestration, put all those pieces together. Red Hat is a major contributor in that space uh, and uh, they, they, we, had, we had lots of coverage with them back at OpenStack Summit in Vancouver. Actually, the joint segment between Red Hat and Cisco talking about how those two are, are working together. Um, so, you know, Red Hat is a you know, strong player in OpenStack. You know, my critique would be there is that I think OpenStack will become majorly important throughout IT over the next, you know, five plus years, just like Linux did. But, you know, th there's, you know, other than Red Hat, not too many companies have made lots of money off of Linux. They use Linux. They built companies like Google. They, you know, launched solutions like, you know, the whole Hadoop marketplace, you know, leverages what's happening in this space. So, OpenStack, or they got sold, like, you know, JBoss, you know, Rob Bearden's, all Rob Bearden's companies got sold. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> I mean, you know, I, one of my best, my favorite memorable lines from last year's is, you know, I asked Jim Whitehurst, I said, hey Jim, why aren't there more billion dollar, you know, open source companies? He said, well, sell and freeze really hard. So, um, you know, as you look at it, I think OpenStack, I'm starting to see a lot of solutions coming out in the marketplace that are powered by OpenStack, or maybe don't even mention OpenStack, but leverage some of the technologies built into it. Storage guys are kind of getting on it. The networking people, um, you know, are, are getting into this space. And, you know, I don't know if there's another billion dollars of revenue on a yearly basis for Red Hat to make an OpenStack, but it's important that they're in this space um, and they definitely are a leader in this and partnering with the broad ecosystem to make sure that they can ride this next wave. Well, and Red Hat is, as I said, sort of growing up uh, but it's sticking to its dogma of open source, right? So everything, 100%. everything that Red Hat does goes into the open source community. So it's 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 free software, free to you know make improvements, etc. And then they sell subscription services on top of that. They are a pure open open source player from that standpoint, much like the Hortonworks model. Um, uh, so so okay, that's that's fine. But they package in their chosen modules, right? They're not allowing you to necessarily mix and match. They'll support certain mixes and matches, well, but they determine what that mix and match is that they will support, is that correct? Yeah, so I, I mean, Dave, I think that the nuance we're looking at here is, uh, you know, when, uh, when Red Hat came out with their OpenStack uh, distribution, uh, they're going to fully support that and it's open and you can, uh, you know, plug in lots of other software, but underneath that, you need to be running the Linux operating systems that they support, which are the ones that sit in the Red Hat portfolio, not the ones that come from Canonical. You know, not the ones that come from Oracle necessarily, even though even Oracle might have the, the, the necessary uh, bits that are in there. So, um, you know, Red Hat absolutely is open, Dave, but th there's the devil's in the details as to, you know, some of those pieces and how much do you need to be kind of under the Red Hat umbrella. Well, it limits, it has to limit, look, I've talked to Red Hat about this, they've, they've indicated, look, we have to limit the choices of what we offer to customers that we will support. I mean, customers are free to do whatever they want because it's open source software. But for us to say that we're going to provide a service and we're going to charge customers on an SLA, we, we can't support an infinite number of combinations. There was a little rift between, you know, sort of HP and, and, and Red Hat at that time, but I think the fact is that HP just didn't have enough of a momentum and a large enough base at this point in time for Red Hat to say, okay, we will certify uh, that, th that package that you guys talk about. Now if HP gets big enough, you know, maybe it will. But that's something that as the 
subscription provider, you've got to pick your spots. Yeah, so, so, so Dave, uh, one of the things I know we're going to be poking into this week is CloudForms, uh, which is kind of the umbrella that pulls together, uh, it, it's the OpenStack, the OpenShift, uh, you know, the, the Linux and the virtualization all under one umbrella, so, you know, Red Hat's expanding their solution set, um, you know, definitely we're going to dig much more into the PaaS space, uh, as, as we talked about at the beginning of the segment. So, I, you know, Red Hat, you know, definitely expanding greatly. Um, I wouldn't be surprised, I tell you, Dave, I was back in the valley and people were whispering, you know, oh wait, maybe Red Hat's going to make this acquisition, that acquisition, and one of the things, you know, I look at in that discussion is, you know, is it going to fit from a culture standpoint, and is it open? So, you know, there's still a couple players in the OpenStack world that, you know, might be a fit uh, or, or not for Red Hat, but as Jim Whitehurst uh, actually wrote in his book, you know, they, they, they've made an acquisition before where, you know, it was like, oh, we'll get to it be fully open source in a year or so, and boy, did that cause some trouble internally. They ended up admitting that it was a bad decision. The way that they rolled it out, they should have bought it got it fully open and then released it, so it caused pain and trouble in there. So, you know, it is the, the open source message is not window dressing at, H, at, at, uh, at Red Hat at all. They are fully committed uh, to keeping it. It's organizationally built into the, the company. It's how they do all their partnerships. Um, and it's a very different way of doing business. And it's a different show, Dave. I mean, the vibe here, you know, some shows, they're all banging their chest as to how many people come. Here it's about 5,000 people here. The show was 4,500 last year. They're not looking to, to be a 50,000 person show. These are people contributing part of the community um, and you know, excited to be part of it. Well, it's interesting what you say about you know, culture. Uh, Jim Whitehurst last night quoted Peter Drucker saying that, that culture eats, you know, beats uh, strategy every time. Uh, and also I liked what you're saying about these companies built on open source software. Facebook is one of them. Jim Whitehurst used Walmart as an example. Walmart, GE, and Ford as examples of companies that were opening up um, ironically uh, I noted, sort of as an aside in Twitter last night, Facebook's valuation yesterday surpassed that of Walmart. Walmart employs two million people. Facebook, well, actually Walmart, more than two million people. Facebook, 10,000. Uh, so we're seeing what we talked about in London in April, Stu, the second machine age, machines <laughs> eating away at the, 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 the jobs, the middle class you know, jobs and the economy. It's creating more wealth, creating GDP, but that middle class uh, is, is under a major, major shift as a result of cognitive essentially replacing human functions. Yeah, I mean, Dave, you, right, you go back to the kind of digital economy, second machine age, you know, Red Hat is a great example of kind of the network effect. It's, you know, how much Red Hat can do, which is still a relatively small company. Um, I mean, Dave, you know, how much does, you know, Linux in general and Red Hat specifically get talked about when, you know, they, they didn't even do $2 billion worth of revenue last year. So, you know, it, it's, it's, they are, you know, huge player, very important, and it's because they helped catalyze, you know, the work in the industry and all of the open source. So, um, you know, it, it's exciting to be here. Uh, lots going on uh, and uh, you know really we've got lots of good guests to dig in over the next two days. Well and like you said you know it is dogma it's hardcore open source if you're not open source if you smell like proprietary Red Hat and this community is going to come after you they believe in the open source world they believe that not only that Stu um, they believe that open source can move faster can be more reliable uh, can obviously deliver more agility and more value. And that's something that we're going to unpack here because conventional wisdom says that, well, if you own the stack, like VMware does and like Oracle does, you can actually do some things and stay ahead of the open source curve. I guarantee when we poke at that here, we're going to hear a different story from this crowd. Yeah, so Dave, you know, Paul Moritz uh, asked him about open source a couple of years ago, and he said when they were looking at what they were going to build for Pivotal, he said you have no choice but to use open source. You know, standards aren't going to do it, and even your traditional development lifecycle, you know, you need you know the community to help. You need to be able to release faster, or release often. Uh, the discussion we had at Docker this week is, you know, typical enterprise software. You know, what's it? Every 12 to 18 months you release. You know, OpenStack was. Like, let's move forward and do every six months. Docker, open source, every two months they're doing a release. So, you know, definitely go faster, update more, add more features in, and allow the users to help co-create um, is pretty powerful stuff. And uh, something that, I mean, we've always believed uh, uh, when you launch Wikibon, Dave. Uh, yeah, absolutely, open source, open source content. Okay, Stu and I will be here all week, Paz week, Stu. We'll be talking about this and other topics. A uh, number of great guests coming on. Red Hat executives, we got customers coming on, we got analysts coming on, so keep it right there, everybody. This is theCUBE, we're live at Red Hat Summit in Boston. We'll be right back.